Good afternoon. Let's see if this is working. Hi, Marta. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. Just wait a few more seconds. And we'll be ready to start. Okay, so it is five o'clock um, and I would like to, to start. So um, if you're joining us um, a little bit later, hopefully you'll be able to, to go through the presentation I've prepared. Um, so today uh, I'm here to, to talk about um, what a psychoeducational assessment is. Um, and I would start by sharing my screen. Let's see. As I was saying, uh, hopefully now you can see the, the PowerPoint presentation I've, I've prepared. Um, and as I was saying, um, I'm here to present uh, to you the topic of psychoeducational assessments and why uh, it is important. Um, so the purpose of this presentation is not only to um, dismystify a little bit the idea that these types of assessments are specific for students that may have a severe special education need, um, but also um, why it is relevant uh, in the process of understanding uh, an individual's learning uh, profile and learning, learning pro process. Um, this way, it is um, it is possible to to better differentiate uh, for the students according to to their specific needs and ultimately reach um, reach a better outcome of learning from from that student. So, what is it? What is a psychoeducational assessment? It is. Uh, a big term, and um, but it's it's quite easy to to understand what it is. Basically, um, a, a psychoeducational evaluation, uh, which is sometimes referred to as a neuropsychic evaluation, is basically a, an assessment of how the student learns, and so it measures different types of reasoning, uh, memory, and working efficiency. Um, it evaluates these, these domains um, in contrast with already learned knowledge, such as, for example, math facts or, um, or vocabulary definitions. Um, psychoeducational evaluations are most commonly recommended uh, for students who uh, at some point are, are having difficulty in school. However, um, However, it is um, the information that can be gathered uh, from this um, from these types of assessments 
can be very, very relevant uh, and useful for any student, um, any student and any individual. Um, so uh, it is important to, uh, in, in this process, it is important to, to distinguish between a, a psychological assessment, which is a different type of assessment, and a psychoeducational assessment. This term may be defined as the type of assessment that is used to understand an individual's cognitive, academic, social, emotional, behavioral, and adaptive functioning within the educational setting. These, these assessments can be conducted um, from the early ages, for example, kindergarten, and go all the way to uh, adulthood. The main focus of a psychoeducational assessment is uh, an individual's functioning within, um, within the educational setting. What can be included in a, in a psychoeducational evaluation? This can vary uh, according to, to the, the students or the child's age and the specific request or the goal uh, of, of which the, the assessment is requested. However, these assessments will uh, uh, always include six key components, which are the components you can see um, on the presentation. Being the first component, um, a background review. What does this mean? That means that uh, the process starts with an initial interview with uh, parents and students, and most often the teachers as well. Um, here, uh, a review of what all the academic records is done, as well as a, um, a background review on, on the individual's health and, and, other, and other concerns. Also, it often includes, um, it also often includes uh, a test of fine motor skills, as well as a hearing and a visual screening. Why does it often include a visual and a hearing screening? Um, because let's think about how often we come across students that uh, may be having uh, difficulty, um, having difficulties with, for example, reading or, for example, following uh, instructions within like oral, oral instructions. Um, we need to understand if there may be any physiological um, impairments or constraints that may be behind those difficulties. So a student may have difficulties reading or maybe copying something from the board. Um, and in that sense, we need to understand, OK, does this, is the this, is this student able to see properly? Um, do they have any difficulties seeing um, as well as as well as um, a, um, a hearing screening. So sometimes a student may have difficulty hearing, uh, they don't hear as well. Uh, so excluding, excluding any, physiological, um, any physiological impairments is very, very important as a first step of, of any assessment. Once those are excluded, we move on to other steps of the assessment being the second one, um, an evaluation of cognitive skills. So the goal of um, evaluating cognitive skills is to have an overall view of the, the child's uh, or the individual's uh, strengths and weaknesses in reasoning, memory, working efficiency, and executive functions. Um, so among the most popular tests used for the cognitive evaluation uh, are the Weschler IQ tests. The Weschler IQ tests uh, have different applications for different age groups. Uh, so basically they're all Weschler IQ tests, but they, the name may vary according to, to the specific age. It's very important here to ask the psychologist who is doing the assessment. Uh, to explain which tests they are using, why they've chosen to use those tests. And um, so in order for you to, to understand and completely agree with, uh, with everything that, that is being evaluated and why. The third key component um, is 
and academic achievement testing. And these, this type of test um, covers uh, skills in reading, writing, spelling, maths, listening, or sometimes uh, others. This part of the test can be similar, um, can be similar to, to the tests that often students take in school. Um, so it's going to, to see uh, on, on a more academic perspective uh, where the, the, the strengths and weaknesses can lie. Um, often, um, and as part of, of the assessment, the psychologist will compare uh, the results uh, achieved in the achievements test with the cognitive test results as well to understand any discrepancies that may occur um, and um, to, that may occur regarding achieve, uh, achievement and also uh, any other cognitive abilities. The fourth key component uh, is any additional or supplement tests that the psychologist might think um, can be useful. So, for example, specific tests can be added to understand specific areas um, that may be causing other difficulties, such as, for example, attention or language, memory, or even processing skills. Suspicion of a diagnosis, or if they want to confirm a diagnosis, or if they need to understand any inconsistencies gained by the test results up until, up until this point. The fifth component is um, a personality and emotional test. These tests are more often called projective tests, and um, they are selected according uh, to the child's age and emotional maturity. They may include, for example, the analysis uh, of, of the, the students, the individuals of the child's drawing, capacity of storytelling or understanding stories, um, uh, their comprehension and the, um, the way they interpret uh, certain things. Um, and the goal here is basically to understand where the child's um, where the child is emotionally as well as cognitively. Um, so because differences between, for example, cognitive age and emotional age can have a great impact on behavior and academic performance. Um, the last one, the six key components of a psychoeducational assessment is direct observations. Being the last doesn't mean it's the less important. Um, it is very important. And here, the psychologists will always use their own professional observations and their interpretation of them uh, to verify a diagnosis. These observations may be done um, throughout the process of the, the evaluation, also, um, also in class or playground or any school context that may be relevant, as well as sometimes at home. Um, here, it's important as well, the teacher's observations and having in consideration um, any observations the teachers might, might have, uh, because obviously the teachers are the, the ones who spend most of the day with, with the students. Understanding this, um, it is important to, to maybe think about when can it be beneficial uh, for, for an individual to, to undertake a psychoeducational assessment? Typically, these assessments will be suggested by a teacher, for example, if they notice that, um, that the student is struggling um, in, in, in some way that naturally um, they would be able to to follow with the rest of the peers. So, for example, if a specific student is um, is falling behind their peers um, in in some subject, um, so sometimes it'll 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 be brought up directly by the teacher. Um, other times, um, it may be parents who who believe or who think. Uh, that the, the the child is is struggling and would benefit from from a more comprehensive uh, assessment 
in order to 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 be able to help them so maybe the 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 student at home is struggling with with doing homework with reading activities or writing activities uh, even maths and the parents want to take action and so they come to us uh, in school um, normally the SEN departments or the classroom teacher they they expose their concerns um, and we help along the the definition of, of the process um, learning difficulties can occur uh, from normally or are most common between grade one and grade two but obviously they can they can happen earlier or later in, in the academic life. What are the signs that we, what are like warning signs we can look for uh, or that may present themselves as hidden challenges um, for a specific uh, student? We may be looking at, for example, low grades on report cards. Uh, on the other hand, we can be looking at disruptive behavior or any difficulty focusing um, during class, uh, sometimes difficulty to complete schoolwork on time. So here we're talking about more uh, uh, difficulties related to, to self-management and to organization skills. Um, other times we can be talking about the feeling of being excessively overwhelmed or excessively anxious in the school environment in the learning environment or during exams um, another another sign may be so for example um, we're looking at a student that we know or that we would expect that would achieve a certain potential or would achieve at certain marks and even though they're putting a great amount of effort into it uh, they are still struggling and still not able um, to, to reach their full potential. So here it is important to understand why. Maybe talking about um, more emotional based uh, uh, difficulties. Um, for example, a warning sign can be not wanting to go to school or displaying behaviors of uh, not wanting to to wake up and go to school whereas normally they would want to um, so obviously here we're talking about lack of motivation and the lack of motivation can sometimes hide a true difficulty that the student is not able to talk about or explain or specifically pinpoint um, so other more emotional link difficulties can also be screened for in these types of assessments and it is very important that the student is formally assessed uh, in order to allow for specific accommodations to be put in place when we're talking about accommodations we can obviously be talking about strategies as well and this will obviously help the student um, be more successful what is the goal of all of this why should uh, why should we do a psychoeducational assessment and how can it help? Um, here it, we address the, the, whether the, the student is eligible or not for specific services and what those services may look like within or without the school setting. And it places primary emphasis uh, on the changes that can be made to that specific setting, where it is, whether it is the educational setting or other settings such as uh, the home environment. Um, and, and these changes can and will benefit the student in the future. The main goal of a psychoeducational assessment is to understand how the student learns. And for me, and when I say me, I'm, I'm talking obviously about the department and, and um, the way me and, and Marta and we as a school have the, philo the philosophy of, of wanting to, to understand what is the student's preferred way of learning? What are their strengths? And how can we use those strengths um, to, to enhance the learning process? and enhance their learning abilities. So the main goal when, when we as a department or we as a school, um, including obviously teachers and teaching staff, when we 
when we recommend an assessment, it is basically uh, because uh, we believe that um, there, there can be uh, ways that we can understand exactly how the student learned and how uh, we can differentiate and accommodate to that. So let's, uh, for example, if we're talking about a student that uh, has a, um, a great visual capacity and their preferred way of learning is through uh, um, a more visual matter, here we can obviously accommodate in the sense of the teachers using, for example, pictures um, or images associated with written um, written instruction or or uh, or oral instruction and paired up with pictures it's going to make the learning process a whole lot easier if the results uh, of, of an assessment indicates that uh, the student has uh, any sort of learning disability um, the school's SEN department uh, will develop what we call an individualized learning plan to accommodate to the specific child's needs, helping them to progress and, most importantly, to succeed uh, and to be happy within the learning process. Let's think about, for example, um, a student that comes up with a result uh, of being dyslexic, of having dyslexia, in this specific case, for example, um, the students will have to put um, a great amount of, of energy and effort and it will be very time consuming and frustrating for them to go through a whole text, um, through a whole text uh, of information. So, for example, a very useful thing to do in these cases is to provide a reader so someone that can read the texts and that can, for example, read the questions um, without in any way compromising um, the, the student's independence in, in answering or the student's comprehension. It will just allow them to be, um, it will just allow them to be more focused on what they actually have to do and not put as much as cognitive effort uh, into, into, for example, reading. So this is just one example of something that we can do with uh, an assessment uh, result. Um, with that being said, um, what are the most common uh, diagnoses? And when we're saying diagnosis, we can be talking about uh, any, any sort of uh, learning difficulty. Um, that can be found within these, these assessments. As I've said before, and I would like to highlight, we are always obviously looking for the areas of strengths within the student's learning profile, um, but this obviously um, provides us with a deeper understanding of the whole picture of the educational ability, so it also gives us the weaknesses. Um, and with giving the weaknesses, it can also identify learning disabilities as, for example, ADHD or an, just attention deficits or more intellectual disabilities with impairment in, for example, reading skills, writing skills or mathematical skills, among uh, a lot of other mental health related issues that can interfere with, um, with learning. Specific learning disabilities or disorders, ADHD, anxiety, or maybe even depression, often stay hidden and can impact the student's performance and behavior both inside and outside of the classroom. So hopefully by now, you've been able to grasp uh, the idea of why it is important and what useful information uh, we can be provided with when we conduct um, these assessments and its benefits. Um, so the whole purpose of the, the, of the psychoeducational assessment is to understand that it assesses most domains of functioning. So all of them, the ones we've talked about before, for example, the cognitive, the emotional, the academic, the behavior, 
um, it is important to highlight that these assessments used norm referenced assessment instruments and uh, it, it, it provides us with a clear understanding of the individual's strengths and weaknesses. An important fact of this is that it obviously is a, a type of assessment that is data-driven and evidence-based uh, approach to conceptualizing a diagnosis or uh, a difficulty. So everything is based on scores, the scores that are achieved throughout the testing. So it's not based upon or it's not just based upon the belief that the, the student is struggling somehow. Um, it is based upon the scores that are achieved throughout the testing. After this testing, um, a written report is produced and feedback is given to the parents. The student, if the student is at an age that is able to, to understand, um, and also the teachers. Within this written uh, report, an action plan for improving academic performance is developed and a list of recommended accommodations are provided linked to those specific scores I was talking about. Ultimately, an ILP, which is the Individualized Learning Plan I talked about before, is put in place and all the accommodations are explained and discussed with the teachers and with their agreement, they are put in place within the classroom context. Um, so we, when we're talking about accommodations, just to give you a little bit of context, uh, I would like to just uh, um, talk to you about um, what uh, an accommodation may look like. So for example, the most common use can be uh, a specific amount of, of extra time, a specific amount of extra time to complete tasks, um, to complete uh, tests and exams or any other schoolwork. For example, access to a laptop or any other specialized software. For example, being able to have spell check, in, uh, spell check enabled, um, the use of calculator or access to a scriber. Uh, other, another example may be uh, access to audiobooks for course texts and material. Uh, so for students who have difficulty reading, um, the same information can be given to them uh, through, um, through an audiobook. Um, the option of for testing and exams having um, a multiple choice test instead of a written test and being able to take those tests uh, within a more quiet and supervised environment. Other accommodations uh, that can be put in place, not just for exams, but for example, uh, throughout the day uh, within the classroom is, for example, having more, more breaks than the ones that are established normally, which are the morning break and the lunch break. Um, so it, it, may be, it may prove to be beneficial for a specific student to have more breaks throughout the day, shorter breaks and just breaks so they can stand up, catch some air, go to the bathroom, uh, wash their face and then be able to come back to the classroom and um, resume focus and concentration and be able to, to, to carry on the rest of the class. Um, for example, breaking tasks or assignments uh, into smaller components, smaller and more manageable components, uh, which is which is a, taking a step by step approach to to tasks. Um, well, I can go on. The list the list is is huge. Um, these are just some examples. Um, and um, but basically, the these accommodations are will vary uh, according to, to the specific case of the individual and the specific um, and the specific uh, difficulties they may be they may be having in a specific point in time. Talking about time, it is important that and this is my last point, so it is important um, to to have an evaluation updated every two years. 
since it is a, a, a measuring test in a specific point in time, um, it obviously will allow us to see the progress of the students. So uh, we believe that in a two years time, we'll be able um, to see the student progress and, and um, develop coping mechanisms, which will help them uh, overcome those difficulties. The scores will be different and we will see if the strategies and the accommodations put in place um, were helpful or not and uh, change those accommodations, make new ones. Um, well, so just it's, it's an ongoing process that can, can, can be adaptive. Um, but for example, if we're talking about, uh, talking about this, the, the fact that the assessments need to be updated, if we're talking about, for example, an MYP student, a student that will have official exams, um, the IB will require a, an updated assessment that has no more than two years to grant that student um, with uh, the eligibility uh, to have accommodations within the exam um, within the exam context. So this brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, hopefully I've achieved the goal of explaining what this complicated term of a psychoeducational assessment is um, and its way of understanding the difficulties of the student. And most importantly, that there is always a path to pursue. Um, when helping a, a student, there's always something we can do. Uh, and though there's always more we can know about the student, that will obviously be very helpful um, for them in their academic life uh, and not only in their academic life but also um, if if this starts in an early age the coping mechanisms that the students will be able to develop will also help them uh, later on in life to be a more successful employee uh, for example be more successful in their work life so that's it uh, i don't know i think i'm a little bit over time I don't know if you have any any questions or anything you would like clarification on. The pretty ladies on the screen are myself and Miss Marta Souza, uh, who works with me in the SEN department. Also, you can find there our email addresses. So you can email us any suggestions of topics you would like us to talk about here or any other concerns you may you may have <laughs> if you don't have any questions um i'll just thank you for watching and bearing with me uh until the end of the presentation um and i'll see you around <laughs> maybe next week Bye, everyone.